so let's see the video. It takes uh, not much, a couple of minutes, and then the conference. The most complicated object in the known universe. I'm talking, of course, about your brain. Even though it weighs only about three pounds, it nonetheless contains an astonishing 100,000 miles of blood vessels, enough to cross the United States 33 times. And in that brain of yours, there are over 86 billion neurons sending signals to one another at the speed of a bullet train. And the 70,000 thoughts that your brain has each day uses enough energy to power a light bulb. The human brain is truly limitless. When it works well, it's a miracle of creativity and potential. Except that sometimes it goes wrong. So it's a good thing that here at Weizmann, some of the biggest brains on this very small planet are working tirelessly to find answers to the causes of many of the diseases of the brain. Their research is at the technological cutting edge of neuroscience. And through their curiosity, we are gaining an ever greater understanding of what's really going on between our ears. Recently there was some headlines because both Hawking and Jobs were warning the world uh, that in their view, artificial intelligence uh, was the greatest danger for humanity that could not be further from the truth. We're nowhere near a level of understanding that will allow us to generate a device that would be close to emulating brain function in a way that would, would uh, provide risk. You would liken our current state of understanding of the brain to perhaps the state that uh, Columbus was at when he set sail. On one hand, we really know a lot. On the other hand, it is so complex uh, that we're nowhere near solving it. We can uh, transplant heart, kidney, lungs. We will never be able to transplant brain. This is the last frontier. This is probably the organ we know the least about. It's controlled everything, controlled our life, controlled our health. So it's the most complicated computer that exists. What we're trying to understand is really what it means to be human, what it means to think, what it means to remember, to have a memory, what it means to forget. So if we think about uh, autism, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's disease. These are diseases which involve social functions, cognitive functions, emotional functions, and the set of regions in the brain which control these functions are the regions that we're interested in. Our department has 17, 18 different groups that span the levels of neuroscience investigation. You have the neurochemists, the electrophysiologists, the cognitive scientists. What is very unique here at the Weizmann Institute is we have been able to grab all these individuals looking at the brain in so different ways and making them working together on trying to solve the riddle of how we understand what needs to be understood. Our group is focused on understanding the mechanism by which the brain is controlling our responses to stress. The problem is when this response is not properly regulated, when it's not properly turned off. Social behavior is actually essential to the survival of all animal species, including human. Surprisingly, we know very little about the mechanism that regulate them. Every system of the brain that is malfunctioning, manipulating the immune system can end this pathology. In terms of Alzheimer's, we almost completely abrogate the disease in animals. Therefore, we strongly believe that when we can identify specific genes and protein in the brain, we can use them in order to eventually develop a better way to, to treat these patients. We know from diseases like Parkinson's diseases that the optogenetic tools give us a much more refined way of stimulating neurons, and that might bring us closer to understanding the disorder and maybe treating it. Social disorders like the autism are regulated, as far as we know, by many genes, but also the environment as a factor. If we find some of the factor, we can maybe get a little bit more knowledge about how can we treat this disorder. We're really excited now about forming what is going to be the Israeli Center for Brain Imaging and Simulation. This will be a national center that will be located here at Weizmann Institute. And we're all kind of brought together under one uh, roof or hub uh, to integrate understandings and cohesive understanding of the brain. Other places in the world, they try to establish brain research centers have the same idea. The difference is that we already have the infrastructure to allow us to do it, to do it efficiently. <laughs>
this is the future, this is where we need to go. Philanthropy at its best is the tool, is the environment that allows science to explore new terrains without limits. It's a partnership. At the end of the day, the mechanisms we study are the mechanisms that allow you to understand what I'm saying now. In this way, we're, we're trying to really understand uh, the essence of existence. It's, it, it boils down to that. questions if anything I say is unclear or if you want some more details and if I think that we need to discuss it in more length uh, I can tell you that we can talk about it uh, at the end. Um, so thank you first of all uh, to uh, Anna and to everyone here for the kind introduction for the invitation to come here. I'm very excited to be here. The last time I was in Mexico was 15 years ago and it's a real uh, pleasure to be back. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to tell you in relatively simple words uh, about the work that we do in the lab um, and why I think that the Weizmann Institute is probably the best place uh, to do uh, this kind of work, the work that we do, and I'll explain why during the talk. So I want to start with a little story that uh, some of you may have even uh, heard about. This guy that you see here in the picture is called Phineas Gage. Um, he lived in the 19th century in the United States and he was a railroad uh, worker. He used to uh, set up uh, new tracks with his uh, crew. And the way they did this was um, they'd uh, go to an area which needed a new track and they'd blow up the rocks so that they could make a new path for the railway. Louder? Okay. So, um, and they, they use uh, explosives in order to make a new path for the railroad. And unfortunately for uh, Gage, this uh, metal rod that you see here is the metal rod that he was using to stuff the explosives into the ground. And one of those days, uh, the, the action of stuffing the explosives into the ground uh, actually triggered an explosion which ended up shooting this uh, rod that he's holding straight through his cheek and out through the top of his head. It's kind of a gruesome uh, story, I know, uh, but the, the miraculous thing was that um, after he was blown away by the explosion, he got up, he was a little bit disoriented, but he walked, walked himself to the hospital and he got treated, and within a couple of months he was back on the job and everything seemed uh, fine. But what uh, his family and his friends started noticing were changes in uh, Phineas Gage's personality, which start, started to take place approximately after he came back to his uh, job. He started, uh, he became uh, very impulsive, he couldn't control his temper, uh, he couldn't maintain his uh, social relationships, and he ended up uh, being isolated from his friends and his families, and he uh, died in San Francisco uh, about 15 years later uh, from complications of uh, lung disease. But the real story was that this was the first time at which uh, the function of the part of the brain uh, which was uh, uh, damaged by the smell rod uh, came to light. And the part of the brain we know today, based on this computer re reconstruction, his skull and the rod you can actually see in the museum in Harvard, um, and based on the reconstruction of the path of the rod through the brain, uh, the scientists realized that the region of the brain that was destroyed by the metal rod is the region that we call the frontal cortex. Okay, this is the part of your brain which sits directly behind your forehead, and it's the part we know today which is responsible for all of our uh, high-level cognitive functions. Uh, the ability to generate and understand language, the ability to retain uh, items in short-term memory, so the fact that you can remember a phone number, like a nine-digit phone number, and then and then dial it, 
is really a result of the uh, work of the prefrontal cortex, the regulation of emotions, regulation of social behavior. All of these uh, highly complex uh, functions are regulated by the prefrontal cortex, and this is the region that we study. Um, another region why we believe that this, uh, another reason we believe this region is so important is because in many cases of uh, psychiatric disease, um, people have identified changes that take place in the prefrontal cortex, and these diseases include uh, uh, all these disorders that were already discussed in the movies that you saw, um, schizophrenia, autism, <coughs> depression, uh, addiction, ADHD, all of these different psychiatric disorders are associated with changes in the prefrontal cortex. But the problem is, and this is where uh, this is where we start, is that we have very little understanding of how these brain regions, these complex brain regions like the prefrontal cortex and the different structures of the brain that it talks to, how they do their job. Uh, we know that if we destroy a region, then we lose a particular function. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we understand how the, uh, this region works, right? If I take away a transistor from the TV, the TV is going to stop working, but that doesn't really tell me anything about what the transistor is actually doing. So, the problem really is the, the sheer complexity of the brain. And it's been already said that the brain is probably the, the most complex uh, organ in our body. Uh, I think that's an understatement. It's really extremely complicated and what I'm showing you here is an actual uh, image of a very very tiny part of a mouse brain and what you see in these these colored uh, the, uh, I, uh, objects are individual neurons so each one of these uh, neurons is like a tiny computer it gets its uh, input it listens to about 10,000 different neurons and it somehow integrates all of this information and generates an output which goes to an equal number of uh, neighboring neurons. And how each one of these neurons uh, works is already very, very complicated. If you, try, if you think about each one of those neurons making 10,000 connections and trying to listen to all this information and make sense out of it, that's a very complicated task. Uh, neurons control sleep or the red neurons control uh, aggression or social function and we need to be able to very much like in genetics and the reason we have such great progress in the genetics of cancer for example is that in genetics we can take out a particular gene and <coughs> learn about what that gene does how that gene contributes to uh, to the function of the cell and to uh, eventually to the disease we need to be able to do the same thing for the brain and over the years, uh, people have tried to develop different ways of, uh, of doing exactly this. Um, and one of the really amazing discoveries has been that, uh, if you, that you can actually change the activity of the brain by using electrical stimulation. And I don't know how many of you have heard about deep brain stimulation. Um, we were talking about it earlier today. So deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease is an effective tool for some uh, patients and it involves the implantation of uh, tiny electrodes deep into the brain so these are the electrodes uh, the electrodes are connected to a pacemaker which is also implanted behind the shoulder blade and the patients that suffer from uh, very severe Parkinson's disease can undergo this uh, surgery which is a chronic surgery and activating delivering electrical current through these electrodes actually leads to a really miraculous change in the symptoms and some of these patients really gain back their life uh, from this treatment. And this is because neurons are electrically excitable uh, cells and if you deliver electrical current you can activate them or deactivate them in a particular way. But, and it's been uh, suggested that this kind of treatment might actually be useful for other types of uh, diseases of the brain including uh, uh, depression and OCD and schizophrenia and autism these are diseases that are not a uh, result of changes deep in the brain these are diseases of the forebrain these are diseases of the cortex which is a very complex uh, organ as I just showed you and unfortunately these studies which have been going on for the last uh, 10 or 15 years have been repeatedly failing okay this is one uh, item uh, just from last year 
saying that another uh, depression trial using deep brain stimulation for trying to uh, treat the symptoms of depression has uh, failed miserably, even though they had some uh, initial very uh, promising results in animal models. Um, and we believe that one of the reasons that these uh, trials are, uh, are failing is because when you look at the cortex, you see the sheer complexity and the number of different types of neurons that are completely uh, intermixed in the, in the cortex. You understand that if you uh, put an electrode into, the, into this region, so the electrode doesn't discriminate between different neurons, right? If I put it over here, it's going to activate the yellow neurons and the red neurons and the green neurons exactly in the same way. And if you do that in a circuit that has so many different functions mixed together, what you get is basically nonsense, right? You can't really achieve a control of a specific function when you use electrical uh, stimulation of a very complex uh, brain area. So, electrodes can't distinguish between uh, neurons. So what can we do to uh, obtain really selective stimulation of particular functions? Can we actually uh, develop a method that uh, can single out a particular population of neurons in the cortex and, <clears throat> and target those neurons selectively and only activate those neurons and, uh, so that we can uh, find the role of these neurons in the, in the circuit? And the technique that we've been uh, working on called uh, optogenetics, as uh, uh, Professor Flisser already said, uh, is letting us do exactly that. And I want to tell you about how it works, and bear with me because now we're going to be to do a major shift and to not talk about brains, but talk about microbes, okay? And what you see here is an algae, okay? It's a unicellular algae. It's a very, very tiny microscopic uh, organism which has uh, very interesting uh, properties. These are these algae. Uh, under the microscope. You need a microscope to see them. This is the algae in the dark. You can see them swimming around. They have tiny little motors and they can swim around. You can see that they swim around randomly. Let's see what happens when we shine light onto those algae. You see a change? Yeah. Right, they start moving away from the light. That's really curious. Um, and this is a mechanism that basically allows these algae to perform photosynthesis because that, this is their uh, major source of energy. And about uh, 15 years ago, we discovered that these algae contain a single gene that allows them to do this. Uh, and I'll tell you more about this gene. So this is the algae. This is a region in the algae called the eye spot. This is what uh, basically sees the light. So in the eye spot are tiny channels that when they're hit with blue light, they open up and they allow ions, electrical uh, charged ions to go through. And this is what changes the behavior of the algae when it's uh, illuminated by light. Now, the major discovery which took place exactly 10 years ago, uh, just before I joined Stanford University, was that if you take the gene that codes, that is responsible for the expression of these uh, channels, you take it from the algae and using genetic engineering you introduce it into a neuron then this is what happens. The neuron, uh, almost miraculously, will start expressing those channels, those uh, tiny opening channels on its membrane and at this point when we shine light onto this neuron the neuron will become activated just like the algae becomes activated which allows it to move forward in response to light. And when a neuron becomes activated, it sends its signals, releases neurotransmitters to all of the neurons that it talks to. And in a way, this is uh, mimicking the natural activity of the neuron. But this time, we're mimicking it using light. Okay? So if we have a group of neurons in the tissue, and all of those neurons uh, are expressing our uh, gene from the algae, we can shine light onto the entire area but now we're only activating those neurons that are labeled with the gene. Okay, we're really selectively addressing those individual neurons. And this has been a really fantastic discovery and it's led to a complete paradigm shift in, in neuroscience. It's kind of become the way you do neuroscience because, because of the complexity of the brain, 
you really need a way to selectively affect the activity of individual cells, individual types of cells, so that you can understand something about these complex circuits. Okay, this is uh, another uh, color of light which allows us to inhibit the cells. So uh, the gene that responds to yellow light is a different gene that's inhibitory. So we can use blue light to activate the neurons and yellow light to deactivate them. So kind of like a bidirectional switch. And even uh, more interestingly, this actually works in living animals. So what I'm showing you here is an animal, a mouse, that has been engineered uh, using genetic engineering to contain this gene uh, in its brain. And this mouse is implanted with a tiny optical fiber, not an electrode, so all, this, all we're doing here is de delivering light into the brain. And I want you to look at the video and tell me if you see anything changing in the behavior of the mouse when the laser start, starts uh, illuminating the brain. So soon the laser is going to go off, if the laser is off. So we have a completely normal uh, behavior of the mouse. So the, the region which was uh, implanted with the optical fiber is called the motor cortex. This is the region of the cortex that controls movement. And specifically the uh, region which is responsible for the hind limbs. And this is why the mouse started moving in response to light. Okay? <coughs> Now, uh, in the lab, I won't go into uh, a lot of detail because I know it's late and you're probably tired, but I just wanted to tell you about the kind of questions that we're interested in uh, in our lab. So I told you about the prefrontal cortex. This is this region over here. Uh, the prefrontal cortex uh, talks to the anterior cingulate cortex, and both of them are in very strong interaction with a very fascinating region called the amygdala. Has anybody heard of the amygdala here? Okay, the amygdala is thought, is thought of as the emotional part of the brain, right? It, uh, it becomes activated when we're afraid, or when we're very happy, or we're, when, when we're expecting something really good to happen, or something really bad to happen. It basically serves as an alarm clock for the brain, saying, this is when you have to pay attention, something, is, something important is happening. And what we've been able to see is that the amygdala uh, sends uh, axons, uh, connections into the prefrontal cortex and using these connections it can actually affect the functions, the cognitive functions that the prefrontal cortex uh, performs. Um, what we've been uh, developing is a way to perform the same kind of uh, deep brain stimulation that people do using electrodes to treat Parkinson's disease but now we're using it, we're using optical fibers instead of uh, electrodes and we can actually address very very specific connections in the brain. So in one experiment that I'm showing you here, this is the amygdala of the mouse. It's connected to the prefrontal cortex of the mouse in exactly the same way that it is in, in the brains of each one of you. Uh, and what we've been able to uh, develop is a method by which we implant and fiber optic, only activating those connections between the BLA, the amygdala, sorry, and the uh, prefrontal cortex. And by shining light in a particular pattern onto those connections, we can reduce the strength of the of the connection, and thereby uh, rescue uh, fear and anxiety-like uh, behaviors in uh, in our mice. Another project that we're really interested in is looking at uh, the generation of impulsive behaviors. And uh, remember how I told you about Phineas Gage and how he became uh, very impulsive. He started gambling. He couldn't control his temper. What we're interested in is understanding what are the uh, cells in the prefrontal cortex, which neurons are actually involved in the regulation of the impulsive uh, behavior. And this is uh, a video that I'll, I'll play now, but what I'll say just before that is that this is based on something like an iPad, which uh, sits here at the end of this uh, screen, and a region over here in which the mice can get uh, sweet rewards. So the mouse learns over the course of a few weeks to perform very complicated uh, cognitive tasks. If uh, it's given this liquid reward, it's kind of like dulce de leche, diluted one to ten. It's very sweet, they really love it, and uh, this is what it looks like. The movie is sped up four times, so you can see many uh, different runs. So every time the light goes on, the mouse has to uh, touch the screen uh, very, very rapidly, otherwise it loses the reward. And the mice become really good at doing it, but what we find is that they're so anxious to get the reward 
that sometimes they touch the screen before the uh, light appears. And this is what we use uh, to understand how impulsive they are. And what we've been able to see is that when we silence, uh, using our uh, optogenetic tools, when we silence particular parts of the prefrontal cortex, the mice tend to do this uh, many, more, uh, many more times. They become more impulsive just by silencing a very specific population of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And what we're doing now is trying to understand who these neurons are, what's their genetics, whether we can actually uh, develop a, a method of uh, activating them or inactivating them that would be uh, generalizable to, uh, to other uh, kinds of uh, diseases, for example, like OCD, which is associated with uh, increased impulsivity and uh, also addiction. And finally, I want to tell you about the method that we're using in order to understand uh, autism. So about half of the lab is involved with uh, studying uh, autism and schizophrenia. And uh, although you might think that these are completely different diseases, they actually share uh, many features uh, in common. And what has been proposed for these diseases is that they're associated with changes in the connections between the neurons. So I told you before that each neuron is connected to, on average, 10,000 different neurons. This it's kind of like having uh, 10,000 people in your, in your Facebook uh, network. You can, you can imagine how complicated that might be. Um, and what we're doing using our optogenetic tools is to record <coughs> from individual neurons in the cortex. This is the prefrontal cortex of the mouse. This is an electrode that allows us to record from one neuron over here. And we can, using our uh, very finely focused laser light, we can activate each and every one of those neurons in the neighborhood of this neuron and we can basically figure out who are the neurons that uh, talk to uh, the neuron that we're recording from and we can compare animals that are healthy and uh, normal to animals that have mutations which cause uh, autism and uh, schizophrenia and as you probably know these are highly heritable disorders so we can use the genetics of the disease in order to try to understand something about how the connections between the neurons changes in these diseases. So I'm just showing you here a video of a, one such experiment. So what my student has uh, developed uh, is a method that allows him to image. So this is using a very uh, advanced microscope. He can look at all of the neurons in the three-dimensional uh, space of the frontal cortex. And then once he has all of those neurons, he can label them and reconstruct the location of each one of those neurons. And once we have the location of each one of those neurons, we can address them, each one of them, with a focused laser and activate each one of those neurons separately. And then he goes through the neurons and stimulates them one by one while recording from this neuron that's labeled here in yellow. And what this gives us is basically a map of which neurons are connected, what's the strength of the connections, and we can correlate back this uh, map of connections to the behavior uh, of the mouse and to try to understand what kind of changes in the connections between the neurons are associated with behaviors that are the hallmark of uh, autism and schizophrenia, like social behavior, like cognitive functions, uh, working memory. So, as I said, uh, we're interested in how uh, the network changes uh, in psychiatric disease. We're also uh, interested in the changes that take place uh, during learning and memory. This is the part of uh, our work that's not associated with disease, that just wants to understand how the brain functions in, in the normal state. So I think uh, I'll summarize here uh, in pictures. So we're interested in this network of brain regions associated with the prefrontal cortex, trying to understand how it works in the normal uh, state and how it dysfunctions in disease. Uh, we use these uh, genes from algae, we put them into neurons, uh, and then we can uh, address these neurons using light. We can excite them or inhibit them and try to understand how, how do you put the, the DNA into the neurons? Okay, so there are two ways to do this. One is generating a transgenic animal, and we have uh, Weizmann, an excellent transgenic facility, which allows us to make transgenic mice that contain these genes in their own genome. But an even easier way, which has uh, been really uh, fundamental in the lab, is we generate, we engineer uh, engineered viruses. Uh, if, you're, if you know about uh, adeno-associated viruses, these are, these are viruses that all of us basically uh, contain in our bodies. They're completely harmless, but we can actually use them as a method for inserting DNA into the, into the cell that we're interested in. So the viruses are a really useful tool because they're very localized. You can put the virus in a particular brain region and it will go into the cells because that's what viruses do. 
but instead of putting its own genes into the cells, it's going to put the genes that we introduced into it. So this gives us the ability to go into very particular types of cells and particular brain regions. Um, yeah, and then finally, uh, we can correlate the physiological findings with behavioral findings and try to understand the links between uh, the brain activity, brain connectivity, and uh, behavior. Okay, this is uh, my group. They're a group of extremely talented, uh, gifted people. Uh, it's very interdisciplinary. Because of the nature of the work uh, that we do, we have biophysicists, we have psychologists, we have biologists, chemists. Uh, and this kind of interdisciplinary effort is, is only possible, I think, in the Weizmann Institute, which really uh, generates these collaborations and allows students from different faculties to go and do their research projects in the different labs. And I think this is uh, one of the really powerful uh, things about the, the Weizmann that I really love. Like. Um, so I'm done, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So we, we're really like uh, uh, someone said in the movie, we're in the dark ages in neuroscience. We've just been able to develop the tools that, are, that allow us to ask this kind of question. And I think it's an excellent question. And, and uh, we have a, a project which, target, uh, which is exactly about this question. We have a project that uses the same kind of cognitive paradigms that I showed you in order to understand uh, the regulation of attention in the mouse brain. Uh, I think when we understand something about that, we can use uh, mouse models of ADD uh, that have uh, genetic mutations that lead to ADD to try to understand how these mechanisms actually change in disease, but uh, we're, we're really just in the beginning of that. What about losing of memory at your age, as your age, the time goes by? It's also there's some research. Yeah, so uh, in memory, what we do is we try to understand uh, how the uh, frontal cortex receives uh, long-term memory. So uh, what we know about the formation of memories is that the, a region of the brain called the hippocampus is involved in making new memories. But then once the memories are made, they're somehow transferred to the frontal cortex, to the cingulate cortex. And uh, what we're trying to understand is how does this uh, process take place. We know that sleep is important for that. Uh, we know that if we uh, silence the connections between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex, we can actually uh, eliminate this process of the memories going to the frontal cortex. But we, we, have, we don't have a good basic understanding of that. So we're collaborating with the lab at the Weizmann in, in our department who's doing functional imaging of the frontal cortex and the hippocampus, and we're trying to look at both structures together to understand how this process actually happens. And as you probably know, the hippocampus is the first region which is uh, targeted by Alzheimer's disease by the, the position of uh, amyloid plaques, and we believe that uh, if we understand the basic mechanisms of how memories are formed and how they're transmitted, uh, we might be able to understand uh, Alzheimer's disease a bit better. <laughs> There is any way to measure neurotransmitter? Neurotransmitter? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, because I know that many of the uh, illness or what we were talking about, you were talking about, it's maybe a lack or more than enough of neurotransmitter. Can you measure? Uh, yes, so th there are many different ways to measure neurotransmitters uh, and they range uh, with different uh, specificities in time and in space. So you can measure, you can use uh, magnetic resonance imaging to record the amount of a particular neurotransmitter, but that has a very coarse resolution. You can insert a probe into the brain which samples uh, the brain, it's called microdialysis, and that has a resolution. Microdialysis. And, and that has a resolution of minutes at best, but we know that the brain operates on milliseconds and not minutes. So what, 
we're doing in order to understand uh, the release of neurotransmitters is we have an optical technique which allows us using the same kind of implanted fibers instead of activating the cells we actually record their, their activity through the same fibers that we use for optogenetics and I think that's, that's a really interesting uh, technique that we're developing so I told you about the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex what we can do now is we can measure the uh, release of neurotransmitters from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex and try to understand under which circumstances this release uh, takes place. Have you done any research on hallucinogens, LSD? Um, no, not, uh, not personally and not in the lab, unfortunately. Uh, no, uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, topic. Uh, there was an article this morning in the Washington Post that spoke about uh, this uh, compulsive behavior that can be changed with LSD or I think those uh, substances have a very profound influence uh, on the brain and it's been already uh, shown that uh, MDMA, for example, which is one of the components, uh, uh, can actually lead to changes, very dramatic uh, changes in synaptic connections between neurons. So I'm, I'm not surprised, but it's not really my uh, feeling. Transgenic mice uh, model, it's more specific to specific neuron you want to target and you use a specific promoter. And when you use an adenovirus, it's to all the neurons that are there, right? So, uh, how do you choose which promoter you use and yeah. how you go about that's your an, research? That's an excellent question. I suspect that you have some background in biology. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, the, the way we go around this question, uh, so in 2009, uh, when I was at Stanford, we were really trying to get exactly at that question. And what we uh, converged on is a method that uses the conjunction between the expression from a transgenic mouse and the injection of a virus that's only able to express in particular cells. So you might know pre recombinase so we use transgenic mice that express pre recombinase under different promoters, and we inject viruses that can only express in the presence of pre recombinase So the conjunction between the specific expression of the recombinase and uh, the, the gene which is encoded by the virus basically gives us the specificity. Does the behavior of mice change according to age? I mean, with a light stimulation? Um, so we haven't specifically tested the response to light stimulation as a function of age, but definitely age is a very strong factor in how mice behave. And just this morning I got an email from my student who's training mice on this impulsivity task. And she, for the first time, took mice that were very, very young and she said she was amazed at how fast they can, uh, they can learn this task. Uh, so young mice uh, generally are much more flexible in their behavior than older mice. I think uh, we can, we can uh, find parallels in, in humans as well. Um, we don't know, and that's a really great question, we don't know how the young mice, which are more flexible, would respond to inhibition of the, the frontal cortex, but that's definitely something that we're interested in. First great question. What is the relationship between all these studies and the regular illnesses that we have? I have a cold. Was this originated by the brain? Is it independent by the brain? I have a stomach ache. Is that created by the brain? Is that independent from the brain? How does this work? Yeah, so... Um that's, that's a whole field which is called neuroimmunology, and I think uh, you, you've probably heard about it. Uh, the brain interacts with the immune system in, in many different and very tight uh, ways. So uh, we know that uh, the immune system can affect the brain. For example, inflammation can uh, reduce the rate with which new neurons are generated, and that has immediate effects on the formation of memories. And on the other side, we know that uh, stress, which is a psychological phenomenon, can affect our bodily functions very uh, strongly. So the, the two systems are very tightly interacting. This is not the field that uh, I'm studying, but I think that there, there's a lot to be discovered in that field. Who's first? 
But who is first? Who is first? My pain or my brain? You mean the chicken or the egg? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that. It is a great question. I don't know. I think in some cases it might be one way, and in other cases it might be the other way. Thank you. Últimamente yes. se está hablando mucho del mal de Alzheimer. A mí me interesa saber por qué hay comunitarios que son hereditarios o se adquieren de, de otra manera. Eso para mí me interesa mucho. So, um, my lab specifically does not work on Alzheimer uh, specifically. Confused by the Spanish. Uh, we do know that uh, Alzheimer, like other uh, brain conditions, can be both hereditary and uh, appear uh, as a sporadic disease, which means that it appears from, from nowhere, basically. And we know uh, for autism, uh, for example, uh, the genetics are being figured out and we know that about 10% of autism cases are sporadic but they are genetic because they result from a mutation that occurs when the embryo is generated. Um, for Alzheimer's it's pretty much the same situation. There are familial mutations that run through families for generations but there are also cases which seem to appear from, from nowhere which are sporadic cases. I think Specifically in Alzheimer's, uh, the environmental component is very strong and it can actually uh, change the, the way, the, the, the history of the brain can change the severity of the disease, whether you have a mutation or don't have a mutation can change the, the age of onset. Um, we've collaborated with a lab that looked at the connections between the activity of the brain and the onset of the, uh, of the disease. And we know that, uh, for example, if you change the balance between two different populations of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, in the, in the hippocampus, uh, then you can change the delay uh, with which the disease appears. So there is definitely a genetic component, but there is also a very strong environmental component. Uh, more than that, I'm not uh, really qualified to tell you, but uh, we, there are labs in the Weizmann that are uh, actively working on this. And, Specifically on the interaction with the immune system with relation to Alzheimer. That's yeah. uh, Michal Schwartz that you saw in the movie, that's uh, one of the uh, strongest fields in, in her life. Hi, before it was widely accepted that there were specific functions in different areas of the brain. With the technique you're using, can you see the pathways between different areas and how how is it changing the idea that memories in the occipital lobe and like ethics are in the frontal lobe and things yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. So I think the the, the general definitions um, still apply. The visual cortex does vision. The frontal cortex does. Uh, cognitive and higher level functions, what we're able to do is to now go down into the details and to really understand how a particular memory is encoded, how is it different from another memory, and these are things, we know that memories are encoded or generated in the hippocampus, but we don't know what different memories look like, how does the hippocampus store all those hundreds of thousands of different memories that we have, uh, so these are the kinds of questions that we can now ask using these more advanced tools. Uh, we also find that uh, the functions uh, that have been attributed to this or that region are much more distributed. So it's not really true that only one brain region does one thing. Uh, we know that memories are encoded throughout the entire brain. Uh, for example, we know that uh, emotions are generated in a very widely distributed uh, network of brain regions, not just in the amygdala. Uh, so I think this is giving us just a much better resolution with which we can ask questions about the brain than before. Another question. You were talking about doing two types of things. The applied part of understanding specific and the basic how does it work. Mm -hmm. and which, uh, we are all people that don't do science, like me, 
they, we think that applied science is the most important because we can see that it works and it cures Alzheimer. What's the importance of basic science? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I'll pay you later for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I th I'll give you two examples. So the field that I'm in now, optogenetics, has really been uh, transformative for neuroscience over the last 10 years. None of us would have been able to do this uh, crazy tricks with the brain if it wasn't for a couple of uh, microbiologists who were working in the salt lakes near San Francisco in 1970s. Okay, They were working on microbes. They had no idea that the, the proteins that were, they were studying uh, are going to be useful for studying the brain at some point in the future. And this is basic science. You do the science for the purpose of gaining knowledge. You have no idea, no way of predicting where this knowledge is going to go. Uh, and the same for the, the uh, uh, thing that Danny told you about, the new treatment for cancer from Victor Schultz. He was doing plant science uh, and, and working on uh, uh, photosynthesis. I don't think he even thought that at some point he would be using the, the information that he had from photosynthesis to apply to treating cancer. And, and now we have a drug uh, going on the market. So I think that this is just the two examples just showing you how basic science is, is important. And I think specifically for, for cancer, if you look at the, the new advanced treatments for cancer, all those immunotherapies that are really uh, curing uh, completely particular types of cancers, they're only possible because we have so much detailed knowledge about the cell cycle and about how cells divide and how DNA breaks and how DNA is repaired. Uh, and this was basic research done for uh, dozens of years. Uh, this is not just someone deciding that they're going to cure cancer tomorrow. Do you tell us what is the present belief of the memory? Is it a static signal? It might be electrostatic, or it may be a voltage, or a chemical, or, or is it dynamic? Is it in a fixed place, or if it's changing places? And how is it created, and how is the process of elimination of our memory? Okay, I need a week to answer this question. <laughs> but basically the answer is, everything that you said is true. <laughs> but so, so, we know today much more about uh, how memories are encoded, uh, partly because of uh, optogenetics, but also partly because of imaging technology. And we're able to uh, go today into the brain with endoscopes, like the endoscopes that are used in, uh, in medicine, and actually record the activity of the neurons, of uh, hundreds and thousands of neurons, uh, when the animal sees a particular uh, object or experiences a particular experience, then we can actually uh, decode the information that the animal is receiving from the activity of the neurons. So we know that memories are encoded at least in the hippocampus, which is the place where the memory is formed initially. I told you that afterwards it gets distributed to many, many more, more regions, including the cortex. Uh, but when the memory is formed, it's in the hippocampus and it's encoded by the joint activity of hundreds or probably more than thousands of neurons. Uh, and when these neurons are activated, the animal can experience the particular memory that these neurons represent. So uh, it's the electrical activity of these neurons, it's the chemical release of neurotransmitters from these neurons to the downstream neurons that receive the information from those neurons. And where the memory goes from there, we uh, still don't understand uh, completely. I think that's a, that's a very important question that so people are following up on and, and we're doing up, uh, some of this work. And we know that it's highly dynamic. So the, the group of neurons that represented my memory of being in this uh, hall today is probably going to turn over within several days and become a completely different group of neurons when I go back to Israel next week. I'll still have the memory, which is, uh, I think, uh, really fascinating to me how that works. I still have the memory, but it's going to be a completely group, different group of neurons that will be active when I think about this experience today. So how the memory is transmitted between these different ensembles of uh, neurons is something that we don't understand at all. Can you please tell us a little bit more about the application of the light therapy in Parkinson? Um, so, you mean the application of optogenetics for Parkinson? Yes. So, so far there have been uh, studies that used uh, optogenetic stimulation in animal models of Parkinson's. Uh, 
Uh, and those studies have shown really remarkable uh, recovery of the animals uh, from the Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, there haven't been any clinical studies in humans, and this is because when you want to translate the uh, basic science finding into humans, you have to go through many, many uh, different hur hurdles on the way. And part of it is, first of all, understanding whether what works in mice and rats will work the same way in primates, which have more, much more complex brains. Even though we know that the circuits are very similar in their structure and organization, the, the complexity is much higher in the human brain. So we first need to do preclinical work in bigger animals, and uh, monkeys for example, and to do a lot of safety testing, because those viruses that I uh, use in the mice, they're completely harmless in the mice, but mice live for a year or two. I need to know that uh, if I inject this virus into a human, then within 10 years the virus is not going to have any adverse uh, side effects, or otherwise I won't be uh, really curing anything, I'll be generating a new disease. Uh, so this process of uh, translating a basic science finding into humans takes uh, many, many years, and I think that it's the same with uh, optogenetics. There are clinical studies now in humans which try to uh, treat vision, uh, loss of vision, using optogenetics, and there's also been a lot, there's already been a lot of safety testing for injecting the viruses into the eyes of patients that lost, lost their vision in particular ways. Um, but going into the brain is a completely different story. It's a much more complex uh, organ and it requires a lot more uh, testing. Animal memory and human memory are similar. Where does the animal act as a natural reaction and where does the human react? So have you been able to find a different path of learning for animals and humans? So, that's a good question, again. I, so I don't do work in humans, but uh, you know we read the, the studies and we talk to our colleagues who are doing human work. Um, there's been really fantastic work uh, being done by an Israeli uh, neurosurgeon called Itzhak Frid, uh, who's working in uh, Ipilov in Tel Aviv, but also in Los Angeles. Uh, and he's been recording from human uh, epileptic patients that have electrodes implanted into their brains uh, in order to localize uh, the epileptic uh, focus. So these patients, they go into the hospital and they stay there for one or two or three weeks until they have enough seizures so that the doctors can pinpoint where the seizures are coming from and then they go through surgery to take out the seizure focus. During the time that they're in the hospital, uh, they agree to have to participate in experiments in which the researchers show them uh, videos or music or sounds or talk to them about their memories and then we can understand something about how the memories are encoded in the human brain and so far there have been reports of neurons in the human hippocampus which is the region that i was talking about before which respond to uh, mentions of particular people or objects or places in very similar ways to the neurons that people have recorded in animals it doesn't mean that the memory works the same way but it means that many features are shared. Um, I don't think I can say that it works the same way, even just because the human brain is much more complex and it obviously has uh, much more capacities for, uh, for learning, for making uh, abstract memories, which we maybe animals can, can have, but we can't really ask them anything about their abstract memories. Uh, so working in humans is, is very different from working in animals. That would be the difference between instinct and intelligence. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. I think the, so the, the instinctive areas, I think you're probably referring to the behaviors that are more innate, like uh, anger or fear or uh, sexual drive or things like that that are thought to be more uh, primal <coughs> and shared uh, between uh, many different species, including humans, but uh, more conserved uh, between species and uh, for that I do believe that the, the functions of those regions are very similar between humans and animals again but this is 
This is my belief. I don't have any empirical data for that. Thank you. Something always caught my attention. Why the dog, the sea dog, when gives birth, eats the uh, placenta of the of the, of the, 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 the animals who were born. When did she learn? She never had one. The first time they had one, yeah. they know what to do. Uh, is that instinct? How did they get this memory? Yes. Yes. This is not memory, it's in the realm of innate behaviors, uh, like uh, aggression and sex and fear. These are uh, things that we are born with. Uh, monkeys, for example, even though they've never seen a snake, they would be very afraid of an object that looks like a snake, and this is another kind of innate, uh, very fascinating uh, behavior. Uh, but th there are some behaviors that are hardwired into our brains, uh, and uh, yeah, they're also extremely interesting. Thank you. Uh, do, do you, I think that if you are an interdisciplinary team, so you in, uh, make invest research or investigation about optogenetic plus what kind of therapy? Because I think cognition needs language. Mm -hmm. It suppose that the neurons go, grow more, you get more uh, dendrites or whatever connections, and uh, while you are giving some type of therapy, of a, yes, so do you know about what to do parallel with that? Yeah, so Example, if somebody goes to autogenic. Mm -hmm. So I agree completely that interdisciplinary work is important, but um, I think as a scientist you have to set your boundaries uh, somewhere, otherwise you know many, many things about, you, you know very few things about many topics, but you don't know in detail uh, about any particular topic, and this balance between uh, what you focus on and how wide you expand your field is, is a very important uh, question in science in general, and I think you can only know so much about uh, so many fields. Uh, what I'm trying to say is basically I think I can't be a good scientist if I try to do both the, the mouse studies and the human studies and the development of the tools and the genetics and the viruses. Yeah, but that, that's, so that's, that's a great point because I think that's where the collaborations within the Weizmann are, are really important. And for example, what uh, we're trying to set up now is a platform at the Weizmann which will allow uh, brain-related collaborations. So it will be a lab that doesn't belong to anyone, but is just a place for people from different fields to come and collaborate on. And it requires you know, equipment, and it's not, it's not something that the typical funding organizations can, can fund, because they're used to funding particular scientists. They don't fund just you know, uh, an empty lab. So th this is something that we're uh, working on very intensively now, trying to really build a place in which interdisciplinary work on the brain can be done. Um, one example that I can give you is that we've recently started collaborating with Asaf Tal, who is one of the scientists that was talking there about MRI. So he's uh, trying to develop techniques to record uh, the release of neurotransmitters. You asked about neurotransmitters using a new technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And this technique allows you to uh, understand the content of a particular part of the brain in terms of what kinds of neurotransmitters are present and what are their concentrations. And if we can combine that with optogenetic uh, technology, we can really understand more about how the circuit as a whole responds. Because when we activate excitatory neurons in a particular brain region, then these excitatory neurons are going to activate inhibitory neurons, and they're going to activate dopaminergic neurons that, can, that are going to release uh, dopamine and noradrenergic neurons. And because everything is connected, then the response is very complex. So I think this is one way by which we can start taking apart uh, the complexity. And, and I agree, it's, it really requires interdisciplinary work. I want to thank you all for being here, for your interest, for your questions. They were really fantastic. And I want to ask Marta, please, anyway, a pasarme al español.
que por favor vengas a clausurar el evento y darte las gracias por una magnífica interpretación. Hoy en la mañana ya tuve una conferencia en el Instituto Nacional de Psiquiatría. Ahorita acá, mañana a las 8 de la mañana, vamos a estar en el Hospital ABC de Santa Fe con el grupo de neurociencias, en una conferencia y a mediodía en la UNAM, en el Instituto de Fisiología Celular. Es que nos lo tenemos bien activadito. Y un último medio, Marta, please. Eh, nosotros le habíamos pedido a Mauricio Berson que hiciera el favor de, de pues, dar por terminar esta sesión de trabajo. Espero que haya sido útil y que haya sido un poco más clara. Eh, es un tema muy, muy eh, difícil, eh, muy, muy concreto y bueno, poco a poco vamos nosotros avanzando en esto. Le quiero pedir a, a ver, eh, las eh, certificadas, por favor, si son tan amables. Bueno, en primer lugar, ¿a dónde está el doctor Offer? Acá. Dr. we love you. And this is for you. And this is from the uh, Mexican group of the Weizmann Institute. Thank you for coming. And I hope you have a sino en la mañana fueron a psiquiatría y estuvo fantástico. Por otro lado, mañana vamos al hospital inglés y luego vamos a hacer una, una serie de conferencias y en la noche tenemos una reunión con jóvenes amigos del Instituto Vice. Entonces, Ana, muchas gracias, te queremos mucho. Y Ana acaba de llegar de Israel la noche, así que está... como un final de broche de oro que como expresidenta le entregue a Ofer un regalo de parte de todos nosotros. We enjoyed that lot. It was very interesting and we learned something about this amazing computer that we have in Saturn. And uh, we hope that you will be here in Mexico and it won't take you another 15 years to come back. Thank you so much.